Hi everyone, welcome to researchmd.com, another great presentation. Today we're going to teach you all about primary hyperaldosteronism or Korn syndrome. Okay, very, very important topic, examination purpose. And uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Pramil Charet. I'm a program director, internal medicine residency, transitional residency. I teach medical students. I'm also a student, I mean, associate professor of medicine to large medical schools in the United States. So let's get into our topic today, which is primary hyperaldosteronism or it's also called Korn syndrome, okay? Um, so when you talk about the first thing, what is the first thing we have to do? We have to de define it or come back to the definition of our topic. So if you look at it, we know it's hyperaldosteronism. That means increased aldosterone, right? There is inappropriate secretion of aldosterone in the settings of Decreased plasma RNA. That's a that is the definition. Okay, so I'm going to um, inappropriately increase all those you know production in the setting of decreased plasma RNA. That is our definition of primary hyperaldosteronism or Korn syndrome. Okay, now epidemiology is very very important. If you look at it, that's the most common cause of secondary hypertension. Okay, so primary hyperaldosteronism is the uh, most common cause of secondary hypertension. So if you just look at some more numbers so we can understand how serious the situation is. Up to 13% of the people with hypertension could have primary hyperaldosteronism. That's a large number, right? If you take 100 people with high blood pressure, 13 of them could have primary hyperaldosteronism or Korn syndrome. Okay. Now, 11 to 30 percent in the patient with the resistant hypertension. You have patients in the clinic or in the office setting. You give one, two, three, four drugs, blood pressure remains high, and then you know the patient have resistant hypertension, then the number go up to like 30 percent. Okay, and so anytime if somebody have like on two or three blood pressure medicine, I think it's good to kind of go back and look this patient have hyperaldosteronism or not. And then 17 to 34% patient uh, with, a, um, let's say look at 11 to 14% in patient if they have hypertension and diabetes. And 17 to 34%, that's the highest, right? If somebody have hypertension and obstructive sleep apnea, that's a huge number. So if you have like an obese patient who said like he's snoring and if you have high blood pressure and obstructive sleep, sleep apnea, if you take 100 people, 34 of them can have primary hyperaldosteronism. Some very scary, scary numbers, right? So be careful when you treat somebody with blood pressure, you should ask question, like what's the question we should ask? Does this patient have Korn syndrome or primary hyperaldosteronism? Okay, now let's look at some of the causes or the etiology. We look at it, there's autonomous overproduction of aldosterone, bilateral idiopathic hyperplasia, adrenal adenoma, unilateral hyperplasia, aldosterone secreting carcinoma, and familiar hyperaldosteronism. Pay very close attention to that. There's a lot of studies, a lot of literature is coming. Why is it so many people have primary hyperaldosteronism? They think there's somatic mutation in the um, receptor, mineralocorticoid receptor, where aldosterone works play a very, very important role. Maybe that's a pathophysiology. So think about the familiar. If somebody have, like, let's say, if your grandparents or parents have, like, resistant hypertension, always kind of think about primary hyperaldosterone. So, okay. And the other cause is, like, ectopic aldosterone production, aldosterone secreting tumor, some could, it could be on the ovary or, like, it could be on the kidney also. Okay, so hope everybody understood that. The main thing I want you to, the most important um, point is when somebody has high blood pressure, I think first thing you should come to your mind to make sure, does this patient meet the criteria for to screening for primary hyperaldosteronism or Korn syndrome? Okay, the numbers could be very high, especially the people if they have obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, 34% can have again. So that's why it's very, very important. That's why I'm repeating it, my friends. Okay, now we're just going to look at the pathophysiology. 
of aldosterone and renin. How does it work together? Okay, so if you look at the adrenal gland right here, um, you got that's the one like aldosterone is produced. Let's look at the normal pathophysiology. When you look at adrenal gland, the aldosterone is produced from the adrenal gland, and the aldosterone is a lipophilic hormone. And it just, what does it do? It just finds this mineral corticoid like MR receptor, okay? And the MR receptor, they're located in so many different places. Okay, now we talk about they're located in the kidney, which we'll come back into detail. They are also located in the heart, cardiomyocytes located. Okay, and then when you look at the brain, in the neurons also is this located. When you look at the vascular muscles in the blood vessel, they also located. So all of these places, this aldosterone can uh, act. But the main mechanism we are interested: in, how does it work on the kidney? Okay. Now let's pay our attention. I mean, we are interested more in the kidney. What happens in the kidney? Okay, so in the kidney, we talk about this principal cells in the collecting duct. That's where the action is. That's where the mineral corticoid receptor. They act on this amyloid or sensitive sodium channels. So you got the sodium pump over here. Sodium get activated, get reabsorbed into the cell. Okay, and then it also activates the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So what happened to the sodium? That get reabsorbed into the blood and the potassium gets secreted, and there's again the potassium channel up here, potassium get pumped into the urine, okay? The main thing I want you to remember, the potassium get pumped into the urine, there's hypokalemia, okay? And then what happens is like also, you can have the sodium it kind of come into the cell, sodium get absorbed into the blood, right? So you should expect hypernatremia. But what happens is like, because of the volume goes up, this A and P uh, get in the heart, get start like natriuresis. So what happens is like we got this overproduction of aldosterone. Okay, now this all this pump get like more activated. There's increased, I mean, you know, channel opening, sodium get pumped in, and the potassium get pumped out. All this activity, like, I mean, in the hyper, uh, hyperactivity kind of happens. Okay, so you're going to have hypokalemia, and then also pump, but there is an H plus ATPase pump also. So what happens is, so you got some, uh, you got hydrogen ion get secreted into the urine. Okay, remember that. So what does that happen? That can make the blood alkalosis. Okay, so there's going to be metabolic alkalosis also going to be another factor we just have to worry about. Now let's look at the renin. How do we bring in renin in here? So renin is actually produced in the kidney, right? And then renin produced and then convert angiotensin 1 into the, from the liver. It happens in the liver. Angiotensinogen is converted into angiotensin 1. Okay, and then there's ACE. Um, angiotensin converting enzyme that's located in the lungs. What does it do? It converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Okay, now this angiotensin 1 kind of stimulate or in the adrenal gland and that can cause produce the aldosterone. Since there is like a lot of aldosterone already, there's a negative feedback going into renin. So renin production is going to be decreased, my friends. Okay, don't forget that. So that is the pathophysiology in the nutshell, what happens. Okay, so let's look at the running one more time. Low blood pressure measured in the kidney and the signal go kidney, I mean to the kidney and renin is produced. From the renin helps in the convert the angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. In the lungs with the, with the ACE, it converted into angiotensin 2 and the angiotensin 2 is the one similar to the adrenal gland to produce more aldosterone. Okay, now when there is an aldosterone, there's a negative feedback going in to decrease the renin secretion. Okay. It's very important to understand the clinical features. What's the number one thing you have to look at it? Blood pressure. There's going to be high blood pressure, right? Hypertension. Now, let's look at some parameters. Systolic blood pressure greater than 150, diastolic blood pressure greater than 100 on three measurements on three different days, okay? And then you can also, systolic blood pressure greater than 140, 
diastolic greater than 90 and resistant to three drugs. You gave three drugs and still under not under control, you have to worry about it, okay? And then you can have polyuria, polydipsia, you can have headache. The other electrolytes we already talked about, what is the potassium, okay? Potassium is very, very important. What did we say about this? Sodium potassium pump, sodium, I mean, the sodium gets in, potassium goes out. Potassium goes into the urine. So what's going to happen to the blood potassium? It goes down, right? So there's going to be hypokalemia. What are the things when you have hypokalemia? What are the things? You can have paresthesia, numbness, tingling, right? You can have muscle weakness, and you can have um, fatigue. You can have muscle cramps. You can have constipation. All the signs of like hypokalemia. Okay. Now, another thing I want you to remember, very specific uh, uh, finding is no edema. In this patient, anytime there's high blood pressure, what do you see the patient like swelling of the leg and all that? In this patient, they will not... Be, there's no edema. There's a phenomena called aldosterone escape. Okay, so what happened? You got aldosterone right here working on the sodium potassium pump. Sodium pumps in, I mean, sodium pumps inside, potassium goes up. But when the volume goes up, heart, you know, it, because you got increased preload, going to the right side of the heart, more volume, A and P is released, that causes like a natriuresis. So what happens is like sodium gets excreted and the volume kind of goes down. So you will not find an edema of the leg. Okay, remember the reason for that, because when you have hyperaldosteronism, the blood volume goes up, increased preload is going into the right side of the heart and be released, more diuresis happen and the sodium gets excreted out. That is the aldosterone escape phenomena. Just the classic word, remember, there is no swelling or edema of the leg in these people, okay? Now, we talked about all this. Now, just look at how to diagnose, like, you know, this. we got this nice algorithm here. So, first thing, we need to suspect. What's, what's your suspicion? High blood pressure and low potassium, right? Those are the two main characteristics. Once we have that, what is the first thing we have to do? We have to measure plasma, aldosterone, and renin. We talk about aldosterone and these two hormones we need to measure, okay? So first thing you do is like measure plasma aldosterone and plasma renin. If both of them increased, this is not primary aldosteronism. Let's go back and look at our definition. What does it say? Increased aldosterone in the settings of decreased plasma renin. Got it? So if both of them increased, secondary uh, hyperaldosterone, so don't worry about it. I mean, I'm not saying like, don't worry about it, but you need to find the cause and treat it, okay? But, and then we are only talking about primary hyperaldosteronism up here. So we have to look at this side of our algorithm. You measure the aldosterone and renin ratio. If it is greater than 20, and um, you can do this confirmatory test. Um, so let's say if you look at the decreased aldosterone and decreased renin, Mainly, you have to think about pseudo hyperaldosteronism. Okay, so that is pseudo hyperaldosteronism. So we have to look in the middle. There is increased aldosterone, decreased renin. You measure the ratio. If it is greater than 20, then we know there is primary hyperaldosteronism. But we have to do some confirmatory tests. What is the confirmatory test? You do oral sodium loading and saline infusion. That means you keep giving sodium and you make sure urine sodium excretion is greater than 200. And then you wait uh, three days and then you measure the urine 24 hour aldosterone. If it is greater than 12, most then in the confirmatory test. Okay, now once you diagnose primary aldosterone, you diagnose primary aldosterone, it doesn't stop there. We still need to do some more additional tests. What's the next thing to do? You get the CT of the adrenal gland. If there is malignancy, then automatically you have to do surgery, right? If it is no malignancy, then you have to go for this adrenal venous sampling. That's the most golden test available to diagnose. You measure the aldosterone. You got, you can differentiate, is it unilateral or bilateral, right? If it is, if you measure aldosterone and the one side is high, the other one is normal, there's then you know it's unilateral. So it's a good confirmatory test to make sure unilateral uh, hyperaldosteronism or bilateral hyperaldosteronism. The reason, because the treatment is different, my friends, for both of them, okay? 
So that's our di diagnosis. Make sure we know the algorithm very, uh, very well. Now, when we talk about treatment, how do we treat it? Unilateral. First, you make sure you correct the potassium. Okay, to make sure potassium is normal, then you go for surgery. And once you did the surgery, make sure the patient doesn't become hyperkalemic. Okay, very, very important to know that. Let's say they're not like, I mean, you know, we have a so poor surgical candidate, like a lot of comorbidity, and you don't want to, I mean, nobody's willing to take into surgery. Then you can do the uh, medical treatment. So let's say if it is bilateral, there's no role for surgery in bilateral. Remember that. You give mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, you can give epiluronone and spironolactone, that's a treatment. You can use the same treatment if they're, I mean, you know, if they're not a surgical candidate, you can use that treatment. Okay? So that's in a nutshell about primary hyperaldosterone. So I'm going to take a seat back and let's summarize our finding like one more time. We have a nice, you know, wide board kind of tell us like what's going on. Everybody know the definition. There's increased protection of aldosterone in the setting of decreased renin. Okay? And anytime blood pressure is high, think in the back of the mind right here. I have to think about aldosteronism, especially if we have diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. Okay? And then we come to this... Uh, you know, the pathophysiology is very, very important to understand. They got adrenal medulla, produce aldosterone, and then come to this amyloid road sensitive sodium channel that get activated and they combine to this G receptor or G protein coupled estrogen receptor and all this get activated, sodium channels opens up and then you got sodium potassium pump here, sodium get absorbed from the urine and, this, uh, and then the sodium into the cell get pumped back into the blood and potassium pump back in here and the finally the potassium channel opens and have potassium get excreted through the urine a lot of potassium is lost what's going to happen you go hypokalemia okay and then there is an h plus um, at phase pump also which pumping so which get activated by aldosterone and then it pumped uh, hydrogen iron into the urine so the blood become more alkalotic there's a metabolic alkalosis also remember that it's like one of the causes of metabolic alkalosis now what happened is when you have low blood pressure kidney senses it and then renin gets secreted from the kidney and then in the liver you got angiotensinogen that is converted into angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs kind of angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 that works on increased production of aldosterone when you have hyper aldosteronism there is a negative feedback so the renin is going to be decreased okay so the increased aldosterone and then decrease running. That's in the primary hyperaldosterone. So main thing then you also need to know the potassium is going to be decreased. And then metabolic alkalosis is also going to be there, okay? And then we talk about the blood pressure measurement. Measure, make sure you know the numbers right here. And always remember the aldosterone escape because, I'm going to say it again, if there is no edema because of the aldosterone escape. Because what happens is like when you have increased aldosterone, increased intravascular volume, so the preload goes to the heart and ANP is released, there's natriuresis, diuresis, sodium get lost in the urine, okay? Now, the definition, you got beautiful algorithm. First, you, I mean, you know, get the plasma renin, uh, plasma aldosterone renin ratio. If it is greater than 20, then you go for the confirmatory test. What is the confirmatory stress? You go to the oral sodium loading, you give sodium and um, make sure the patient excrete like more than 200 uh, milligram in the urine and then you wait three days, you measure the aldosterone, that is the 24 hour urine aldosterone. If it is greater than 12, then you got your diagnosis. Once you have the diagnosis, there's still uh, some tests you have to do. First one you have to do is like you do a CT scan, okay? So main thing you need to make sure there's no malignancy. If it is malignancy, you cut it off. There's no malignancy, then you have to do this adrenal venous sampling, which is a confirmatory test again, gold standard to differentiate between unilateral and bilateral, okay? Once you know it's unilateral, you know there's need to be surgery done. And then if it is bilateral, you give mineralocorticoid uh, receptor antagonist, epiluronone, spironolactone, that is the treatment. And the, finally, if the patient is not fit for surgery, you can do the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, epiluronone, and spironolactone.
that's all my friends thank you for watching please subscribe to our channel and take a lot of effort from a lot of people to make a presentation like that and study hard thank you